Baja California. Uh, it was wonderful, wonderful time there. A few days. And uh, for me, I, I, people ask me, you know, hey, so how did you like Mexico? Honestly, I was like, I'm always surrounded with Latinos and Hispanic people and stuff. And so they're just lovely, most friendliest, most nicest people in the world. So I'm like, honestly, I didn't feel like, except, of course, the, the area. But other than that, uh, it was a very, very wonderful experience. I had a chance to um, see and do wonderful things there. And then I was suffering for the cause of Christ and the beaches of San Diego. And uh, <coughs> struggle is real, hashtag. But we're really happy to be back home. Amen. Thank you for all the birthday, birthday wishes on uh, Facebook. I found out today on Facebook that uh, it's my birthday. And so uh, just throwing it out there for you and stuff. And so, but good to see everyone. I know that we have uh, some people actually from Belarusia who are sitting in the back with our past. Let's give them a round of applause. Amen. And then we also have Oksana's sister. He came all the way from uh, Seattle, Victoria. A little disclaimer. She's hating Ultra Cities. So, Ultra City people, we're going to have to change things up here today. But we love Seattle. Uh, she's from City Hill. We love City Hill as well. Amen. And I actually just read on the news that Ultra Cities, the um, unemployment in Ultra Cities fell to 6%, which is the lowest in like some... 20 or something years which is really really nice and so we really love our city amen and we believe in the next 16 days we're going to have our conference kingdom come can somebody say amen we are excited and so in two two and something weeks we're encouraging each person that we're going to bring two new people to church two new people to church one on friday and one for saturday and so on both nights we're going to expect just the power of God. I know we have people here right now like a gentleman who was healed of asthma at the last conference and who's still running and praising the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to believe for notable miracles and the touch of the Holy Spirit to touch people in this place. Can somebody say amen. We will see the kingdom of God come and the kingdom of the devil be destroyed. Can somebody say amen. And so in just two weeks we're really believing that I ask each one of you let's really push and work hard to also one of the ways you can invite people is actually through Facebook on your Facebook event just go ahead and just invite you know other people on your friends and uh, and others so that people will come. Our city needs revival. Our city needs Jesus. I saw on the news that uh, we have about 25 major violent gangs in our city. About 1,300 to 1,500 people in our city are involved in gang lifestyle. And a lot of these people come from broken homes. A lot of these people, their life are broken and their life is shattered. And not only they live in hurt, but they cause hurt to other people. And our goal is not to remove gangs. Our goal is to replace. We want these gang leaders to be hunger pleaders. <laughs> come on, somebody. Come on, if you can gather people and buy wheat and buy tequila and do all illegal things, you can gather people and be filled with the Holy Spirit and bring people to night prayer and go get some other people saved. Can somebody say amen? And so we are really praying for our city. We are really praying for our generation. Those of you who are visiting us for the first time or maybe you've been coming and you may see kind of, you know, a radical approach toward these things. I want to tell you something. The devil doesn't sleep and God passionately loves our city. And we want to reflect that by loving on our city and by praying for our city and passionately standing for our city. Can somebody say amen? amen? And we know that revival is the will of God. The kingdom of God is the will of God for our city. The young men and young women will rise up and serve God. They will rise up and they will do good things and influence our city for the glory of God. These guys like Eric, these guys like Elizabeth, the guys, the younger generation, we believe that they will rise up in a very soon, they will have their own youth service and we, we will have awesome new building and we're going to have awesome new things. Thousands and hundreds of people will be getting saved and hundreds of home group leaders that will be started in here. Can somebody say amen? That board is going to be too small. That board is going to be for bishops because God is just going to do an awesome things. Why? Because God has a big heart and the devil has big plans for our city. We're just trying to keep up with the devil. Can somebody say amen? Every single person deserves a second chance. Every single person deserves to have hope in their life. And every single person deserves to have Jesus and to have life in their life. We're sick and tired of religion but we need something real and genuine. And that something is not something. It's someone. It's the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? amen? And you saw, you know, and some of these testimonies might be minor, you know, oh, person had throat or this. 
or that until you get that problem then it's no longer minor. You're running to every doctor and to every pharmacist and asking for off-the-counter, under-the-counter medicine to get cured of it and stuff. So, but we know that the Holy Spirit that we love and that we walk in, He heals people. He delivers the captive. Some of you heard what happened last weekend where some of our people went, you know, also we took some of our people for prayer for deliverance and demons came out and there's another trip that's going to happen this weekend. More demons will come out. Amen. More Jesus, less demons, more revival and less ruin in our city. That is all we are for. Can somebody say amen? Let's put our hands together for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our vision is clear and cut. We want to see thousands of people give their lives to Jesus. Hundreds of home groups raised up. We wanted to make it popular. We wanted to make it good. Not just that religion is for those, you know, people who just, you know, don't have anything else going on. And it's for everyone. But Jesus wants to be in our city where other people want to serve Jesus. Somebody says that most people will never read the Bible. You are the best Bible they will read. Make sure you're the best version they will read of the Bible. Let's be the good walking Bible in our generation and we will see our generation touch for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? So 16 days, kingdom come. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 25 until verse 28. And it says the following, Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely to revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord. Reboham, king of Judah, they will kill me and return to the king Reboham. I'm sorry, this Jewish name is really difficult to pronounce. <laughs> I'm like, Jerob, what? Why couldn't they make it like Smith, Larry, Vlad? Verse 38. Yeah, Jose, Juan, Pablo. Anyway, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? The gas prices went up, traveling tickets are high. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out from Egypt. Say this prayer with, out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus, open my heart to your word. Lord Jesus, open my heart to your spirit. And Lord Jesus, open my heart to your faith. Amen. I want to speak to us just for a few moments about a topic of lasting legacy. Lasting legacy. There was a guy in uh, in one city who had a friend and he comes to his friend and he looks very depressed and very sad and he says tell me what's going on why are you so depressed and why you're so sad he said well three weeks ago my uncle died he said oh he said no no, no that's not the depressing part he said he died and he passed me an inheritance of fifty thousand dollars he's like wow that's good he says why are you depressed he says well two weeks ago he says my aunt died and she also left me with some inheritance. He says, so why are you depressed? He says, well, this week nobody died. <laughs> See, when somebody dies in your family, they pass on an inheritance. They pass some things to their next of kin. We must understand one thing is that legacy and a dynasty is something the Bible talks about all the time. We see this king and you might not be familiar if you don't read much about the Bible I will just introduce this guy to you give you just a very simple basic introduction about his life you can learn more about him in the pages of the first kings. There was this guy named Jeroboam. He was the first king that Israel had when they divided up from the Solomon's kingdom. So first there was Saul, David and Solomon. Solomon commits sin. God comes to Solomon and says because you've committed these sins I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you the whole kingdom to your next generations. You will have everything fine but next generations won't have everything fine. And the next generation that rises up God takes the 10 tribes away from the kingdom of David's dynasty and gives it to this fresh guy on the block named Jeroboam. 
and God comes to Jeroboam and he tells him that if you will obey me and follow my commandments like King David did I will establish your dynasty that as long as there is kingdoms and kings your seed means somebody from your lineage will sit on the throne over the 10 tribes of Israel he said I will still allow David's guy to sit on the throne for as long as they will be alive but you will be like the second guy to David so there is David and there is you you'll be parallel with David I'm giving you this chance don't blow it and we see something happens to Jeroboam Jeroboam begins to make mistakes and these mistakes they cost him not only his own life that it become difficult but these mistakes affected his destiny and his the destiny quickly spilled into his dynasty i want you to write just these few thoughts down write down that every decision you make affects your destiny and your destiny affects your dynasty dynasty is what happens after you're gone each one of us sitting in this room today we must understand that we are someone's legacy somebody made decisions and these decisions affected their life and when they were gone these decisions affected you the place you're born language you speak the habits that you carry many of these things most of the time come from the tree we all come from and many people don't realize is this is that we all carry also someone else's dynasty someone else's legacy somebody made decisions and it caused you to eventually fight or have victories in your life because somebody didn't win the battles or have won battles for you and while you're sitting here trying to sort through the mess at the same time you're also making a decision for children that will come out of your life that will be affected by your decisions you may say well I'm not gonna have kids you will still have an effect on generation even without having kids Jesus didn't have kids yet he left a legacy that has affected this world when I look back at my life you know and I could pat myself on the back and say you know what at the age of 24 I was married and at the, the day of my marriage I was a virgin I lived my life dedicated to God you know I lived my life seeking God you know I could pat myself on the back and say I wasn't addicted to this I wasn't addicted to that and everything but in reality if I be very honest I will tell you that one of the reasons that my life turned out and trust me my life wasn't that easy as I just made it seem like but if I would be honest what is the reason half 50 percent of the battles I never had to fight it's because my parents my grandparents and my great-grandparents won those battles for me and today those battles they don't exist like they're still there but they don't affect my life as much as they affect somebody who comes from a family where people in the family didn't fight those battles it's not fair why it happens it's not fair but it happens that's how the world works Adam makes a mistake he affects his destiny and then this his destiny he doesn't just disappear and everything everyone starts from the beginning no one starts from the beginning you start where others left off and everything Adam made a mess of got passed on to his kids and his kids instead of fighting with one another they killed one another and then you see the next chapter that those kids they pass on another legacy where we see violence in this world so severe so bad that God says these people are just going nuts this is unbelievably horrible why because that's exactly what happens whether you realize it or not you pass on a dynasty to a next generation that's just how it works when I look at my spiritual roots you know with I heard stories of uh, from my grandma and from my pastor from my parents of uh, distant relatives and descendants who went to jail because they were Christians and they were tortured for Jesus because they were Christians and then they died out of the wounds that were afflicted on them because of following Jesus it makes me appreciate and understand that one of the reasons that God has blessed and protected me it's not because I'm spiritual or perfect but because 
I'm also somebody's dynasty and while I'm enjoying that there's also other things that I need to fight that maybe they haven't fought with I'm also creating that dynasty for the next generation that is coming after me if you look even amongst us today this is not to point fingers this is not to belittle anybody or make somebody feel like man sucks to be you got born on the wrong side of the tracks this is to make us understand you are gonna leave a legacy because you are living in someone's legacy right now you gotta deal with that and you gotta understand that you know when I look at uh, Brittany and Bryson Stephanie from the family of Stills you know their father who is here Tim and if you, if you would look at their dedication to God you know if you would and I know them a lot closer than most of you if you would look at their commitment to God through thick and thin and you will say wow well you know where's that commitment they're such, such a committed Christians but if you will look deeper you will you will see that that commitment is not just with them it started with their parents and if you will look deeper you will find out if you knew their grandpa you will find out how committed to Christ grandpa was that in this church he was baptized with the Holy Spirit in this exact building that's where he met God and he encountered God and so guys these things work like this you are in someone's legacy and you are creating someone's legacy right now at the same time and we must understand that our decisions are not just you when you're smoking you're not just having fun you are creating a pace for the next generation when the battle comes with pornography and you say you know what ah, I, I just want to indulge in it and you pass on the battle instead of winning the victory you're passing to a next generation a battle you haven't fought God wants us to be a generation who doesn't pass battles to next generation but victories and trophies to next generation and we're gonna be that generation can somebody say amen Too many people have grown up being passed on divorce, abuse, drugs, all kinds of you know broken family, anger and dad in jail or mama in jail, mom and daddy always fighting you know and that is not our fault but at the same time you and I can change that realizing I can deal with my history and I can create brand new destiny for my future and for the future you're unborn. God promises to Jeroboam and he tells him I will bless your life and right away God says I will bless your dynasty God is not just interested in blessing your destiny not just in making your 70 years in this world somewhat okay God wants to bless your dynasty your generation your name and generations that are born can somebody say amen you know you look at our grandma you know look at how many people today who are in her dynasty kids who are serving God and those who are not serving God they're just working on their testimony watch out they will be serving God then they'll be catching up like I told my brother Andre I was like you you're slacking I was like wait wait once you get saved you're gonna catch up all of that nobody gets a free ride in our family and that's why you see now he's catching up all those years that he wasn't serving the Lord that's how God does it with us and why because somebody paid the price when you're serving Christ, when you're coming for morning prayers, when you're evangelizing, when you're starting home groups, it was look like man other people just living up their life. You will live your life even better but the best part is the children that will grow up. They won't see knives flying like in the movies in the room. They won't see mom and dad choking each other but they will see kindness and love and they will also grow up just like you actually better. Can somebody say amen? You know I see Larissa and Leo when we just started our church and we started our little youth group and Larissa became our one of the helpers you know we're little you know 17 18 year olds running around not knowing what we're doing and Larissa was there almost every single time she would sacrifice her family time sometimes her husband will get mad at me because you know she would spend more time there than even in her family we were immature so we kind of pulled everything everything together we took everybody's time with family was always last Jesus first ministry second but honestly even in our immaturity even in our lack of knowledge you know and I saw the commitment and sometimes I was like man she's sacrificing too much she has a family she needs to go do her thing I mean we don't have nothing else going on you know so we can do that and now when you see her kids you know all of her kids how they're serving God Vicky Eric Elizabeth you see their commitment to God you see their passion you see how they are in the kingdom of God and you see how God by blessing her life says you know what my blessing is too much for you to contain it's gonna spill 
on your next generation. Can somebody say amen? I think it was a few weeks, it was the last weekend when the young lady went to, uh, from our church, you know, went for deliverance and a demon that was coming out of her mentioned that the demon was there for like 17 generations because some 17 generations ago ancestors took a live person and they sacrificed it to idols and to demons and 17 generations later the enemy still was trying to influence that dynasty don't fool yourself please you're not just living for yourself the enemy and God understands this principle let's we understand this principle your decisions make your destiny your destiny spills into your dynasty somebody say amen when Jeroboam he becomes the king God delivers him out of the hand of Solomon because Solomon makes threats to destroy Jeroboam and Solomon is a very rich and very wealthy guy Solomon was so rich that uh, his armor weaponry was made out of gold he had nowhere he had nowhere to put that gold so he made shields out of gold he made spears out of he made stuff out of gold the bible says the silver and bronze was like nothing in these days tons of gold not grams not pounds tons of gold was delivered to him every year this guy was so rich that there was no enemies comparable to him he literally he just was on the top of the world but he started disobeying God and God started to raise up Jeroboam and Jeroboam he comes you know probably to Solomon and says hey you're not doing this right you know God is already kind of making some arrangements and Solomon begins to make threats and says I'm gonna take you out I'm gonna take care of you and you know if this guy is so resourceful doesn't like you you're in trouble you're in trouble and Jeroboam is the little guy who stands against a huge empire who stands against a rich and a very influential, resourceful, well-connected, powerful king who wants to kill him. Yet God delivers Jeroboam. And it's interesting how God delivers him. He sends a person into Jeroboam's life. It's a prophet. And the prophet says, this and this and this and this will happen to you. When you have a problem in your life, big as big as Solomon, when you have a problem in your life so humongous God wants to deliver you from that problem but not always he will deliver you the way you plan for him to deliver you sometimes he, God will get you out of certain troubles in your life first through a person he will send into your life a pastor or he will send into your life a mentor he will send into your life a home group leader or he will send a good Samaritan who will pick you up and who will take you to church or who will pick you up and begin to bug you to meet with you so that they could see your life changed then we see with Jeroboam when God sends a prophet that prophet gives a promise and the prophet says listen God is gonna give you ten tribes I know that right now you are on the blacklist of King Solomon. Right now you are being persecuted but listen God has a promise for your life. The way God delivers us is when we are at the bottom. God gives us the loftiest, the craziest outside of this world. You are not crazy kind of promises. God doesn't wait when your life starts to improve. Come on everybody believes in those promises then. God does not wait when you begin to make adjustments. God waits when you are at the bottom of the bottom. The only thing you care about is how not to die and God says you will be a king. God gives us a promise in our mess. God gives us a promise in our dilemma. God gives us a promise. God gives us his word of hope when we are at the lowest and you gotta be a fool to believe it. It worked for him. It will work for you. Can somebody say amen? But you know when he received the prophet he received the promise and God gave him a third thing he gave him a hiding place to run and hide until Solomon would die and Solomon died every big problem in our life if we surround ourselves with right people if we surround ourselves with right knowledge and if we find ourselves a new place if you come today and you're struggling with drinking you can't hide in the bars on the weekends. No matter how much about a Mazda show about a Honda you're gonna say in those clubs. It's not gonna work. You have to have a hiding place. 
many people don't see their life change for this one reason they don't have a new place where they kick it they come to church on Wednesday but on Wednesday is where they do church it's where you do it on Thursday Friday Saturday Monday night Tuesday night it's where that is the place where either will crush you or build you up everybody comes on Wednesday it's where do you go after Wednesday after the person maybe in right now it's going to be me or somebody who says something after you hear the word of God God also gives a place because see you can come to the prayer line demons can come out of you you can go to the best deliverance place in the whole world but listen if you don't believe in God's promise and if you don't change your zip code that deliverance will not last that deliverance will not be permanent you got to change the place where you kick it you got to change the place where you relax you got to change the place where you feel at home with your homies and your cronies you see when you come to church you look goofy you look funny you look religious you look yes amen praise God brother and sister but when you come to your place hey what's up home what's up dude because that is your home that is that is where you're at home but in church you won't feel like that right away but until you find yourself new group your life will be stagnant I'm not saying in any way that you have to make it right away in the church but you have to find yourself people who are good you make the place a hiding place with them it means you find a comfort zone with them where you can find those relationships built for the glory of God can somebody say amen and Jeroboam he gets delivered Solomon dies Jeroboam is protected finally he becomes a king and that's what we read when he becomes a king he has a lot of people with him ten tribes probably thousands of people maybe a million the only problem Jeroboam has is that Jewish people they have this uh, very sacred rituals and religion where they worship God and three times a year all the men have to go to the temple and they also have other festivals where they worship God and they have a temple already built very expensive temple and Jeroboam is afraid if my people our kingdom just got divided if they will start going to my other guy's kingdom to worship God three times a year and the other guy is gonna get up with a microphone and says God is good they're gonna say amen and they're gonna say what are we doing with our guy let's switch let's you know kill him and like, reunite the whole kingdom like God promised to David so he becomes afraid he becomes insecure and the Bible says instead of taking his insecurity to God instead of coming to God and saying God Solomon when he became a king he fit into the shoes of his daddy his daddy's shoes were big Solomon was inexperienced his daddy was a warrior Solomon was nobody but Solomon went to you and you raised him up to be the most powerful man God I'm just like Solomon I am nobody I am scared I don't have a temple I don't know what to do but please help me you told me I will be a king when I was on the runaway from this powerful king and God your word became real could you help me now instead of doing that Jeroboam he fueled his insecurity in some other ways he gathered people around he said hey guys how can we keep people from running away from us and one guy gave him a proposition he said let's build idols like metal wooden statues and let's put it right in front of people say hey guys you want to save money on gas we got you covered right here no who needs a temple Jeez, I mean that's so long those roads are so dangerous we can redo it in our neighborhoods you come bring your offerings slay it right here worship God and go back home and live your life see our relationship with God is based on trust when the trust is broken insecurity will creep in our relationship with our fellow humans is based on trust see when we hear word faith we immediately have weird ideas about faith because faith sounds so out there almost like you know Pope Francis like faith is like oh, so out there Mother Teresa like but I'm, I don't want to use word faith with us right now I want to use word trust because trust is easy you told your friend your secret and he wasn't supposed to tell anybody and he did what happened trust was broken you guys are still friends but there is no relationship sometimes people are in marriage and there's trust there's relationship 
if one person goes and starts talking to some other chica on Facebook guess what happens trust is broken when the trust is broken they will still have their names on the mortgage they will still sleep in one bed but there is going to be no relationship because our relationships are as good are as big are as deep are as strong as are as long as our trust no trust no relationship relationships cannot live without trust just like you cannot live without oxygen if there is no trust you can be handsome educated rich talented charming and sexy but you're not gonna have a relationship you won't read the Hollywood pages read the news and you will see the most talented the most beautiful the most richest people who have everything that we sometimes maybe wish secretly and they don't have relationships keeps breaking one to another why because there is no trust there why is there no trust there's a lot of other reasons no trust no relationship and Jeroboam he had no relationship with God because he didn't trust God to see him through what did he do he simply had a broken trust where he, he wasn't sure whether God will come through and where there was broken trust, guess what happens? Insecurity comes in. What insecurity comes in? Well, insecurity does two things. First, it makes you insane. And secondly, it makes us into idolaters. We all feel insecurity. But when security takes over, when insecurity captivates us, it makes us a little bit insane insane means we become a little bit crazy suspicious we hear gossip 20 million miles away every time somebody looks wrong at us we already know they're thinking about us and been thinking about us for the last 24 hours and they haven't been sleeping but only thinking about us because that's what insecurity does it does to all of us insecurity creates a person and makes him into a little monster ask Cain and he will tell you when his brother sacrificed he brought it and God favored it and Cain's offering wasn't favored and a little monster green monster grew up in Cain and he said mm, that's not right I, I worked as hard as why did he got honored and not me and little monsters are crouching crouching and a little beautiful wonderful son of Adam became a monster who killed his own brother how could that be because insecurity grows in the soil where there is no trust with God and when there is that insecurity listen it turns us quickly and slowly into green monsters even the best of us become the worst when we allow insecurity to spring up in the place where there is no trust in God I heard of this uh, eagle who had a friend eagle that was faster than this first eagle and this friend eagle came to the hunter and says hey could you shoot that faster eagle because he makes me feel very insecure if you shoot him I will be very happy he says yeah of course I could but you could you give me one of your feathers so that I could use it as an arrow uh, to to push the arrow so I can shoot that he's like oh yeah for sure he gives him one feather and the hunter begins to aim on this fast eagle he aims at it so hard but he misses it so he comes back to the eagle he said listen I missed it could you give me one of your feathers again he said yeah for sure he gives him feathers that guy keeps missing it until that eagle gave all of his feathers and stopped flying and then the hunter killed that eagle that's kind of how it works in life you give all of your feathers out in insecurity hoping to hunt somebody down because somehow we believe if I can kill your light mine will shine brighter and we have that little monster inside of us and it's all developed out of not having that trust in God that God will meet you through I know somebody's being blessed right now listen you might be next don't get all worked up God is preparing the best for you yes maybe right now Saul they're singing about David but listen praise God God picked you as well but they added 10,000 for David and they gave me a thousand I can't live with that don't download the song who asked you to go on iTunes and download the song? Don't listen to it. Listen to something else. He listens to the song and it bugs him and he grows up into a monster. Instead of being anointed, he hunts David for the rest of his life and kills priests. So the day the father made the garment for Joseph, it's better colors. Who cares? It's fine. He deserved it. He doesn't do anything. He needs to wear a nice garment. God bless his heart. Go mind your own business. No, we can't accept that because we got to tear it apart. And next thing that happens, insecurity makes into a little green monster. We become a little bit insane. 
if you ever watch yourself when you get insecure you will find yourself being a little bit insane crazy insane You're like why am I even scrolling through this you just came to your girlfriend's house why did you just put a bug in your purse why did you have to hack into every password why did you have to stalk her to, to a little bit insane and same thing happens in relationships same thing happens in every because insecurity makes us insane we have reasons for it of course it's them her and her but in reality it is a little bit of insecurity makes us insane another thing that insecurity does is it makes us into idol worshipers it makes us into people who now don't have trust in God that he will come through that God will bring me the husband at the right time that God will bring me the children at the right time God will bring me promotion at the right time God will open the doors where there is no doors he will see I know right now it looks like I am suffering I am nobody and other people are going up but listen there is a God and he knows my number and that simple trust you don't have to have a master's degree in theology but just a simple trust there is a God and he loves me and he has not forgotten that I exist that thing cures insecurity oh no 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 trust me you will still feel it but you won't feed it why because you know you're feeding your faith I remember you know when there was a time and and I was passionate I wanted to see I wanted to preach and you know there was not opportunities for me I wasn't invited nowhere I invited myself to jail I would go on Wednesday to preach in jail me and Ilya would take a little stereo little stereo thing on the batteries and would go in there and I remember it was so embarrassing because every time we would go in there they would scan us sometimes three four times because there's two Russian young dudes with hats walking in into jail preaching the gospel of course preaching the gospel what are you carrying in there and I remember six months later I'm like my goodness God when can these security guards learn that I'm not here trying to sneak in some dope to my Russian friends I don't even want to see my Russian friends I just want to preach the gospel and right after that jail we would go in get in our cars and drive into the gospel mission and we would stand there speak and then right after speaking go up there to serve food and I would do the month after month not one person I preached the same messages that I go today and preach at other churches or other conferences the same messages I preached at the homeless shelters same ones didn't change a thing but what changed you know and and our youth group was so small and it seems like you know other people were moving up and sometimes I would have the man other people God just blessing other people I mean what am I doing here but you, you see after you kind of walk with God for a little bit you develop a little bit of trust you know one thing is listen he didn't leave me there he didn't leave me here he didn't drop me there and he didn't hurt me there he came through here and he came through there and it compiles a little bit of grain of seed of trusting you know what maybe perhaps he won't leave me maybe perhaps he will see me through maybe perhaps everything will work out and honestly when you stick long enough you will see God is faithful you will see like David says that listen I have lived long I've been young but I've never seen the righteous man forsaken or his children begging for bread because God is faithful can somebody say amen you know, today it's a different story in my life it might not be like that tomorrow where you know almost a week now for this summer almost every single week at least three places I get invitation to speak every single week where before I would get three invitations in the whole summer and I would do a praise report to the Lord and I don't go to those places of course now because I'm busy with what God is doing here and I'm so happy with not with the invitations that's that doesn't matter I'm happy with this is that through this I've learned just a little bit more that when I feel insecure not to yield to it not to fall for it because it will make me into a monster little monster and it will make me inside into a person who will begin to worship idols run around like Abraham with Hagar instead of waiting on God's timing I just want to encourage somebody's faith to tell you listen the God that has brought you to this will bring you through this build your faith repair your faith repair your trust in God and you will see God will not disappoint you you will see God he will pick you up he will raise you up don't be the person who is envious jealous or insecure don't be the person who shatters his trust in God God will come through for you God will come through for you I remember when we just came to camp uh, last week and we uh, somebody forgot to pick us up on Monday we arrived in San Diego called and said hey guys can you come and pick us up they're like uh 
we forgot that you're coming today so could you just wait for two hours there and then get a taxi get to the Mexican border I was like which border I'm like I'm not sure I feel you know very safe you know just just kind of kind of heard stories and stuff and so and uh I'm like can you come and pick me up they're like no you have to get there and I was like where do I meet you where do I find you guys I'm gonna walk in with bags I mean I, I don't know about this we go into the we go into the uh, into the airport to wait for two hours and my wife goes and orders this uh, Asian food and I just had a weird funny feeling about it and I went and got Jack in the box instead I went to get Jack in the box and there was a lady there who watched the manual TV who recognized my wristband. She's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. She just went like, oh, ballistic. She couldn't believe it. She's like, did a praise report out there and stuff. And I was like, okay, lady, give me my Jack Spicy and go do your praise report in your break room. So I get my little Jack Spicy and we're eating. And the moment Lana starts eating, she's like, you know what? This, this tastes really weird. And it did. The moment we get picked up off of the Mexican border, Lana starts throwing up about five times in two hours on the way there I thought it was just a road sick maybe it's twist turns we get in there and it continues like every some 15 minutes she starts throwing up and I everybody's attention was awakened so everybody saw that we came and everybody saw that she's sick and I'm there you know, I'm already preparing my mind how to pray for healing and I'm like this is not helping I'm like tomorrow I'm gonna pray for just encouragement for those who are sick I'm like I can't pray for the, for the healing I remember I mean I mustered up my faith I was like God just please you know heal my wife and I know food poisoning I was food poisoning in Africa once it took two weeks off of high fever and I'm like and then we have a little mini vacation in San Diego I'm like this is definitely the devil and after we prayed we prayed we prayed it was there's just one that night she went to sleep and and I remember she looked at me and she said Vlad I want to throw up one more time and during this time she says I just stole myself that's it no more after this I'm gonna go to sleep and they said I don't know whether it's fever food poisoning it has to stop and um, next morning when she woke up all night she slept without throwing up whereas before she would throw up every 15 minutes no matter what she didn't eat anything already she would just throw up she woke up in the morning she said I feel completely fine went and ate and what it did is it and to some way this may not a big deal but to me when I went there to preach when I know that one of the things that I aim for in every service is for the healing of the sick to me it was, it was a very big deal and it strengthened my faith I remember when the night came to pray for the sick I was like a lion that somebody poked around I was like I was outraged inside against sickness I was just saying stuff there that I don't very very just emotional about it why because now my trust that this God who you know saw through me through through this now will help me through and then people start getting healed and then one thing after another you know and this more encouraged my faith you know so now you know it's my birthday and I'm arriving and guess what happens right before I get home I realize I lose my iPad no I don't care about the iPad the only problem is that it had no passcode on it and it had very sensitive information right on it and I got, just got home and I was like and I'm supposed to preach about trusting God and I'm pacing in the house I was like what am I gonna do I'm gonna lose my identity I'm gonna lose my identity I mean it's just it's just kind of devastating and I went to the airport to look for it they're like nope it's somewhere some we don't know where you just have to call this number which you know if you're gonna call nobody's gonna pick up and I remember coming back and I, and I told myself I was like God I've seen you be good to me not because I was good and God I've seen them out of even most difficult situations you always somehow things will always work out I'm like God I'm gonna trust even with this everything will work out you think this story has an ending that I found the iPad no I haven't found the iPad but I found trust my God will fail but if somebody finds it and I lose my identity my God won't fail I just want to inject that into you today whatever you're facing muster up your trust blow your insecurity out of the water and tell your insecurity I have a God he's the fountain of perfection he's my God I'm not gonna compete with no one I'm not gonna try to prove anything to anyone I'm gonna trust in him and at his time he will raise me up he will bless me he will strengthen me and he will prove that he is on my side and somebody say amen I want you to rise to your feet and can we all of us come to the front